Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Everyone, my name is Myra, and I'm an alcoholic. Myra. Um, it's an honor to be a part of this conference and to know all of you guys, so thank you. Um, so uh, what's kind of been on my heart since, um, or what's just kept coming up, which to me is the intuitive thought of what to talk about, um, and um, these two, like calamity with serenity, that's what keeps coming up to me. And I've heard it mentioned a couple times throughout the weekend, you know, but it says we are in the world to play the role he assigns just to the extent that we do as we think he would have us and humbly rely on him, does he enable us to match calamity with serenity? And calamity means an event causing great and often sudden damage or distress, a disaster. I mean, I was calamity. (laughs) But like everything was, like anything that happened in my life while I was drinking was like, a, it was a calamity. It was just like, I, I am very emotional and I overreact in sobriety. So imagine before, like everything was just like, I would crumble and fall apart and not know how to deal. And I didn't. So I just drank. So, um, basically, I, I mean, you all know what it was like before. I don't need to talk about that. Like, I think that pretty much says enough. Um, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of an idea of what matching calamity with serenity has looked like for me recently. Like this year has been a little bit challenging. Um, and I've kind of been dealing with, uh, you know, it's like parental aging parents has been a really big, um, piece of what's been going on, um, around me, not to me, but around me. Um, and that's like a, a gift that I can say that, that it's like, this isn't happening to me or, you know, because I did something, but I have two parents, um, with dementia. They both live in different part, you know, they're, they're separate. Um, I am the power of attorney for both of them. Um, my mom has, you know, I saw this coming about three years ago and it has like, there's flare ups of like, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I'm the one who initiated the power of attorney because I saw it coming that she was, you know, that this was going to be an issue. Um, my relationship with her is strained. It looks different than my relationship with my father who like, I completely adore and like am heartbroken and so sad. Like I lived with him. I didn't live with her. Um, but I feel a sense of responsibility to help to some degree. And um, I get really wrapped up in trying to manage and control and what that looks like and what I need to do. And like, this is my responsibility and I can't do this. And you know, and then I forget like that I am here like as an agent of God and to show up to do what he would have me do. And I forget that and thank God for sponsorship and all of you that, you know, remind me that, Like, it's not up to me um, that I have a God and um, that I am safe and protected and and my parents will be safe and protected, right? The the reality is, is like, we're all going to die. And, um, but I have these hard, like this stuff where I'm just like, how long is this going to go on? Like, I don't know how I can continue doing this. Um... So my, my dad's wife passed away in January and she had been like the caretaker of my dad always, like even before he started, you know, um, forgetting things and she didn't let any of us know, you know, and she had made all these plans. She was very, a, a very controlling person and, and it was great because she like took care of all that stuff, but she took care of all that stuff and now my dad doesn't know what to do, you know, and it took a good I mean, it took like almost six months for me to like finally get everything like with a power of attorney to get everything managed and like me to be able to help him with that. And then we moved him. I mean, thank God for, thank God I have God, Uh, but I also have a really wonderful and supportive husband. I do have a, a really wonderful, beautiful older sister and she has been helping too. And so that has been an incredible blessing. 
Um, but we went down to Arizona, showed up, packed my dad, moved my dad, unpacked my dad, and my husband and I got to spend a few days in Santa Fe, New Mexico. But we did that in four days. And I'll tell you, like, without God, like, I, that d- doesn't seem possible to me. Like, he had a 2,500-square-foot ha- home, and he didn't pack. Like, he couldn't, he can't stay focused. And so, like, for us to be able to do that, and it was hard. It was a lot of work, and but we did it. And I look back, like, wow, like, we accomplished something that I don't know many people could have done that, like, turn around like that, you know? Um, so, anyway, like, now my dad's a little bit settled, but he's just not, you know, he's not doing well. But, but the matching calamity with serenity, like, I have been calling my dad almost every day since she passed away. And I did not talk to my dad on the phone. Like he was just not a chatter. He didn't talk on the phone and like we didn't talk and it wasn't because I didn't want to talk to him or he didn't want to talk to me. We just didn't talk on the phone. And now I talk to him. I I will like now it's probably four times a week, but like I talk to him, he calls me. Um, he texted me the other, the other night when I was having a moment of fear and thinking that I wasn't you know, that I was like not part of, that I didn't fit in somehow, which is funny now that I'm here. I know that's, that's the dishonesty that my brain tells me. Um, but as I'm like in this and I'm talking on the phone to my sponsor and I get a text from my dad saying, I love you. You are special. You know, as I'm tense stepping about my fear of not fitting in and, and so like, and I can see the beauty in the fact that I get to talk to my dad like as frequently as I do now and that he still knows who I am, you know, and that he leans on me and says, I think, thank God you're here and that you're so smart and that you can help me with all of this stuff. And that's a gift. It's a huge gift. And, um, my mom on the other hand, like she, uh, she lives about 45 minutes away from where I live. Um, you know, like for about two years, like I said, like I haven't known what to do because we don't have, we don't have money to put her or give her care that she probably needs at this point. Um, she gets a little too much money a month to get any assistance from, you know, the state. So like we're in this pickle, which I think there are so many people in this country that are in that position and it's, heartbreaking and it terrifies me and I'm not going to bring her to live with me. I can't, I don't have the room and I I am not capable of doing that, unfortunately. And I will tell you that that's, that's okay. Like I've been a little bit embarrassed and you know, I feel bad for saying that, but like those are my boundaries, but I don't want her to suffer. I don't want her to starve to death. You know, I can't, so I get these flare ups, right? And, and the, and COVID hits and I know that she's still going to the bar and she can still remember that she can use her credit card on memory, like muscle memory, but she'll tell me to my face that she doesn't have a bank account. And I know she does cause I have access to that bank account and make sure that I pay her credit card bill that she's using. Right. Um, so I had found, um, when everything shut down, I was like, well, that's the only place that she's getting food. And how am I going to, um, you know, how are we going to, how am I going to help make sure that happens? Because driving to her place once a week seems like too much for me to manage. And I found a woman who, um, um, through, uh, a sister of a woman in the program who offered, who lived in the area and said she would do that. And she's been going and bringing her groceries once a week for two years. She called me two weeks ago and said, I got a promotion and I'm moving to San Francisco. And I was like, that's so wonderful. What am I going to do? You know? And then. Uh, a week later, which is just last week, you know, I, again, I like, I call my sponsor and I'm like, what am I going to do? Like, and she said, you just, you need to pray. Like, remember you have a God. And, um, so I, you know, I pray and I get a, a text message from a stranger last week. And this woman saying that she uh, lives across the street from my mom. And my mom has been telling her that her last name is Coley, which is her maiden name. And, um, randomly out of the blue two weeks ago or a week and a half ago, my mom pulls out her driver's license for, I don't know why, but she, the woman looks at it and gets her real last name and was able to locate me through social media and found my phone number and texted me and told me that my mom has been going back and forth from her house to, you know, from my mom's house to this neighbor's house like 30 times a day. And she's been feeding her and taking care of her. 
and she is disabled, so she works from home. She can't drive, and like out of the kindness of her heart, she wants to make sure that my mom is taken care of, and that there's people in her church that want to help her. And I'm crying to the stranger, like I didn't know what I was going to do. Like you were an answer to our prayers, and I didn't even know she's been doing this for a year already. And she's like, I want to continue doing this. And I'm like, I can't even believe this is happening, you guys. Like, I mean, this does, I'm like, and I still, part of me, like, wants to, like, where are the cameras? Like, are you trying to scam me? And she's literally just like, your mom needs, you know, I take her for a walk. She's texting me, like, all this information. And to me, I'm like, I just want to make sure that she's fed and not, like, suffering. But this woman, like, is invested. And out of the kindness of her heart, she's a stranger. You know? So, I mean, I don't know, like, to me, that is like a, like, God is real, y'all. Like, that is real. Um, you know, and I can recognize that, like, God is providing for my mom, and God is helping ease some of the, you know, God is here to help me and be here for me, and I, um, I just, uh, that gift of, like, being able to, to know, like, I mean, life is hard, hard and I know a lot of people have shared with me that they have aging parents too and you know this is a lot of things that a lot of people have gone through I know my time is up but one last really quick one last thing is that I was chairing a meeting and I was like I don't know how to do this and I was reminded by somebody that um from what from where we're standing you are doing it like I'm watching somebody do what you're saying you can't do you know and I and that was a really nice reminder that you know with your help with God's help um, with these steps in this program that, that, um, that I can, I can do hard things and I can do this. So thank you. Hi, my name is Madison. I'm an alcoholic. And I'm Madison. I can't touch the microphone at my home group. It's like a service position. Somebody sits there and they adjust the microphone. And if you touch it, people freak out. <laughs> I love this. I'm going to like Axl Rose this thing. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny, for asking me to. Um, sorry, Janet. Some people have been calling me Madeline, so it's okay. <laughs> Thanks, Janet, for asking me to speak. I'm really honored to speak here, and, and thanks so much for hosting me. You have been amazing. Okay, yeah, and get me some water. <laughs> and another cup of coffee. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm really honored to be here, and um, thank you to the committee, everybody that helped put this thing on. I know how much it takes to put one of these things on, and I... It was amazing, actually, how small the committee was compared to all the people that were here. And I know that um, I'm helping plan a, a roundup, a new roundup that's never taken place, and I'm the chair of it. And it's um, talking about principles before personalities. You know, I have to kind of keep going back to the primary purpose is to serve the alcoholic who still suffers. Because I want to make it about me and the weird personalities in there, and, and really, ultimately, who's it about? It's about that person that comes in and says, you don't understand, I'm unique. And this won't work for me. The steps, I need special steps. <laughs> <laughs> and I relate to that. That's been my experience, is I need special steps. Um, I always feel, uh, especially, I feel inadequate sometimes speaking. I get asked to speak occasionally at different places. But I've never been the Sunday morning speaker. And my friend April, who came with me from Anchorage, she was giving me a hard time, like, ooh, you're the spiritual speaker. <laughs> and then this morning, she's like, don't touch your face. You always touch your face when you're talking. <laughs> I was thinking of you up here, Ellen. <laughs> Anyway, I'm, uh, I feel like uh, kind of inadequate, but I know that's pride in reverse. And I, I just feel like we've had so many good outpourings of like serenity and solution and walking through calamity with grace and dignity. And uh, I just, I came here thinking, oh, I'm going to be of service to the alcoholic who still suffers. But y'all have ripped my heart out of my chest, massaged it, and put it back in my chest upside down. Like I just feel like 
this has been such a powerful conference for me. I've heard so many things that that I relate to and so many things that have touched my heart and softened my heart. And I, I'm completely like, I'm not super spiritual. I, I feel like there's been like so many like spiritual Yodas that have been up here. And I'm like, it feels like, you know, and now I'm the spiritual Chewbacca, you know, it's like, <laughs> We're going to end this thing with Chewbacca. <laughs> when you take the computer sober, you reach. <laughs> um, but I have had a spiritual experience. I've had a psychic change. You know, I'm a different, I'm a, a 180 from what I was when I came in here in, in so many different ways. And, um, you know, we're, I really love that six and seven step panel. And I was thinking about step six and all the ways that I'm, I'm 27 years sober and I feel like I should be more spiritually fit than I am. I've always felt like that. Like I should, you know, know more about concepts and be more of a, you know, whatever. I always look at people's social media and hear their shares and, compare myself to them and, and like wish that I could be other people but for the first time in my recovery I I just want to be Madison and it's such a beautiful thing and uh, that's probably the greatest gift I, I've gotten from Alcoholics Anonymous is just being comfortable in my own skin regardless of other people's opinions and uh, but anyway was, I was thinking about step six and, and when I came in here um, I used people big time I used people as things you know I used people as and never considered how my actions affected other people and um, you know I used people for sex I used people for drugs um, I withheld forgiveness that I should have given like I I'm a punisher like if I get a resentment I'm gonna punish you you know the silence you know I'm not gonna talk to you anymore that's a character defect that's been lifted. You know, another character defect that's been lifted is that um, if you irritate me, I'm going to take my toys and leave. You know, I'm going to bail on this thing. Um, I'm a big fan of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me in my life, like bar none. Like it's, you know, the power of, uh, of my God and the connection with other people is so profound in my life. It's like it is the greatest gift that I have. Um, I don't love everything about Alcoholics Anonymous and I don't love all the personalities in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't love the language of Alcoholics Anonymous necessarily, but I like the underlying principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. My home group is a, a very large group. It's called the Glacier Group in Anchorage, Alaska. And um, the thing I like about it is there's a lot of enthusiasm. There's a lot of laughter. They're all about service to the newcomer and they're in the big book. Like those are the things that I love about Alcohol Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I didn't get sober to have a veil of tears like it talks about in the book. Like, I want happy, joyous, and free. That's ultimately what I want from Alcoholics Anonymous is happy, joyous, and free. And I, and I see it, and I feel it actually a lot more than I've ever felt it in my life. But there's things, like there's personalities in AA, like my, my home group. Um, I'm not going to get into it, but I got a huge resentment at kind of some people in my home group the other night. I got a call from somebody else's sponsor telling me that one of my sponsees is doing something jacked up. I'm like, what is this, like, PTA? Like, this is, <laughs> like, I'm not their god. Like, but used to be things when they irritate me, I just take my stuff and leave. I'm done. And um, the other big character defect that I have is um, making other people's brokenness about me because I'm so super self-centered that everything that happens is about me. You know, and it's, it falls under that, how have I been dishonest? You know, when I'm lying to myself about your behavior being about me. I remember one time I was driving from Anchorage to Wasilla, and this guy was riding my tail, and I was doing 75 miles an hour. It's a 65 mile an hour area. And this, I was going to get over. I couldn't. As soon as I cleared this car, I tried to get over, but the guy shot around me and flipped me the bird. And at first, like, I just wanted to. Like, I'm a pretty mellow person, but I actually have the potential for really ra rageful behavior. And um, it just occurred to me, like, that guy is freaking out. What a freak. Like, let him go and let him be, you know. And that's, it used to be that I would have, like, all right, road rage, here we come, you know. And I just, life is too short. I want to live to the fullest right now. Like, 
happy, joyous, and free. It's very difficult to be happy, joyous, and free when you're full of rage. And um, yeah, I'm an, I'm an ER nurse. I've been an ER nurse for 17 years. I was a paramedic for five years before that. And it's, it's a really good perspective to have. Like these people that wake up in the morning and they think they've got a long time left and they don't, you know, they had like a couple of hours or whatever. And I think that's really helped me to live right now because I, I do, I like get in my head and I plan all these things are going to happen. But like, you really have taught me to live one day at a time, one hour at a time and be where my hands are. And that's such a gift. Um, I'm definitely alcoholic. I only, I'm 49 years old. I've been sober 27 years, so you can do the math. I got sober when I was 21 and a half. I only drank and used drugs from the time I was 14 to the time I was 21. Uh, but in that time, I just, I went from, there was no slow, gradual work up to it. It was more or less insanely drunk from the very beginning. And I jumped very quickly into into drugs. I did a lot of crack. I smoked a lot of crack and did a lot of acid. And uh, it just, it's its amazing how my life, you know, I remember growing up, like, you know, Bill talks about in his story, you know, my people warned me about it. They said, you got you to stay away from it. It's bad. Like it runs in our family. Both of my grandfathers were alcoholic. Uh, they both, by, excuse me, died prematurely from alcoholism. Am I touching my face yet? <laughs> Um, they both died prematurely from alcoholism. And so, like, I had that warning. Like, I had, um, I'm originally from the South. I, I grew up in uh, Alabama and Georgia. And, uh, you know, I, have a, I was raised by my parents. My grandmother lived with us. I'm the youngest of three kids. I got an older brother, older sister. And, and I, I have a good family. Like, they really are some of the kindest people I know. And, I, and through the immense process, I have an amazing relationship with them today. And, um, but anyway, I remember, like, my grandmother talking about what a jerk my grandfather was. Like, my mom used to pretend like she didn't know who he was. He would show up drunk to pick her up from the movie theater, and she would act like she didn't know him. You know, my mom is this beautiful, like, she's 85 years old now, but she's, like, the, the most beautiful, kindest woman on the planet. But definitely qualifies for Al-Anon. And, uh, like, when I first got sober, I was, like, sending her all this literature about Al-Anon. Like, I was like, you need to go to Al-Anon. And I realized, like, I'm just trying to control my mom to make my life easier. Like, oh, if she's in Al-Anon, it'll be easier on me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she's never gone to Al-Anon. You know what? And that relationship is incredible. Like, my behaviors have completely 180 and so has hers. And it's, it's just such a beautiful thing to... It's, it's one of the greatest gifts of my sobriety is that connection I have with her. But anyway, they, they didn't drink in front of us. They didn't beat us. There was sexual trauma in my, in my past. It wasn't my folks, but that kind of stuff really haunted me um, as a kid, and, and I carried it into adulthood. But I think the biggest thing for me, though, when I was, um, when I was little is uh, I was assigned male at birth, and uh, one of my earliest memories was playing the, the praying that God would turn me into a woman. Like, God, please let me be a beautiful girl when I wake up. Like, and it, you know, it's one of the very earliest things that I can remember. And I don't know how old I was, but I remember my dad took me to the zoo and it was just he and I, and, uh, it was such an amazing day at the zoo. And my dad is just a funny man. He's very funny and, and intelligent. And, um, we were sitting there eating dinner and I remember thinking my life is perfect. I love my dad but I want to be dad's little girl. And I was like, I'm a freak. Like that was followed by, I'm a freak, you know, I'm a freak. Something's not right with me. And then I remember we'd sit at the mall. We were waiting. I, I always wanted to go with my sister and my mom and my grandmother to go shopping. But me and my, my dad would take us to the arcade. This is like the eighties, early seventies and eighties. And my dad would take us to the arcade. And then we'd go sit on this bench and wait for them to come out of whatever department store they were in. And I would look at the women and I would be like, okay, the next woman that I see, that's the woman that I get to be for my life. And I'd be like, oh, wait, not her. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I I did that up until recently, you know. <laughs> and I, um, I didn't know that, I mean, this was, I was born in 1973, so this, I didn't, there was no word for transgender, I just, I just knew that I was, I was different. And I thought, I thought it was something broken. I thought I was broken. You know, I thought, thought of some brokenness of my soul. 
And I, we went to church all the time, and I remember hearing this sermon about, it wasn't about trans people, it was about gay people, and, and how, like, some revival happened, and these gay guys went there with holding hands, and they left with, like, wives or something. It was really absurd. And, uh, and I just knew, like, there was a shift where I was like, I'm not right, and I learned the word abomination. I'm like, I'm an abomination. I'm an abomination. And then when I hit puberty, um, I realized that I was attracted to men as well. And then I was just like, this was like, I don't know, probably like 1982, 1981. And, you know, the only, my only reference was like, I mean, this is Alabama. Darwin's waiting room. Like, (laughs) it wasn't like... Yeah, I just felt, I felt like such a freak and like something was wrong with me. I also had a lot of rage as a kid. I chased my brother with an axe. I chased my brother with a knife. I hit him in the head with a giant Sesame Street fold out weeble wobble thing as he came up the stairs and and just like, I would get so angry. I remember one time I just, I was trying to take apart a lawnmower because what else are you going to do? And I just, (laughs) I couldn't figure it out and I started smashing it and getting so angry and it wasn't about the lawnmower it was about just like you know like I hear people say in AA I could have used to drink early and I think that's true for me as well but I just felt like such a freak because I'm actually like I'm really outdoorsy I was really athletic you would have never seen me as a kid and guessed that I was trans or queer you would have never known I was in the Boy Scouts. I was the first one at the head of the trail when we were backpacking. I remember we did this backpacking trip in the Okefenokee Swamp in Georgia, and I was, like, wading through waist-deep water, like, super excited. The other kids were behind me, scared shitless. And I was, like, I remember a snake came down this tree and went in the water with this. I was, like, God, did you see the snake? And they're freaking out, and I'm, like, so comfortable. And I'm, like, I just felt, like, this weird... Like, I I feel very, it's weird. Like, I always used to tell myself in my own gender, like, I feel, in fact, there's still parts of me that are extremely masculine. But anyway, I thought I saw your reality, and I compared myself to your reality, and I kept feeding that narrative of, I'm a freak, I'm a freak. And uh, we moved to Atlanta when I was, um, I think I was 13 years old, 14 years old, and I... um, I got immediately got in with the wrong crowd. And I remember being a kid saying, I'll never drink and I'll never do drugs. And um, by the time I was 14, I'd had my first drink. And within probably another year, I was smoking crack pretty heavily. And it was, um, I remember like, there was such a decline. I had all these dreams and hopes as a kid. Like, I'm like, I want like I used to watch Jacques Cousteau or read about Jacques Cousteau or like these mountain climbers or people that would go skydiving and like kayaking and stuff like that. I was like, I want to be like that when I grow up. And alcohol just said, no, we're going to go this direction. And um, my grandmother loved me. Like I was her favorite and she lived with us. She, she, she was dying of cancer and uh, I was her favorite. She would always buy me gifts and my brother would be like, why didn't, why am I not getting the stuff that she's getting? And, and um, I remember one day uh, we were drinking whiskey. We were drinking Jim Beam sitting at the table, and I was 15 years old. And we didn't hear her pull up. And she came in, and she was devastated, right? Like, she saw her favorite grandkid drinking whiskey at the kitchen table, just like her husband used to do, who was such a jerk to her. And it was devastating to her. And she was definitely a member. She would have been a member of Al-Anon. She was like, I'm going to tell your mother. And she took the bottle and poured it down the sink. And I was like, Grandmother, please don't tell Mom. Please don't tell Mom. I'll I'll write you a swear-off note. I'll swear off, Grandmother. I swear I'll never drink again. I'm getting chills actually telling you this. But I wrote, um, Grandmother, I love you. Please don't tell Mom and Dad that I was drinking today. I'll I'll never do it again. I love you. And um, she took that. And, of course, you know, that was BS, you know. And I continued on. My life went down very quickly. Like, I never was very good in school. I got put in remedial classes. It wasn't because I wasn't intelligent. It just was, I was so full of fear. I was just weird with all kinds of, you know, one of the cool um, 
parts of the big book is actually not told by an alcoholic in the back. There's a there's a doctor that came and hung out with us for a couple of, I don't know how long he hung out with us, but not long. It's, called, it's the medical view on AA. And in the end, this dude says, you know, in this atmosphere or something, you know, these alcoholics can overcome their excessive concentration upon themselves. Excessive concentration upon myself. Like, that's what I've got. And, like, that's a pathology. It seems like a wise thing, but, like, for me, it's just, it's not healthy the way that excessive concentration upon myself. And, and I had that as a kid, so I can't focus. I can't focus on anything except myself. And uh, I failed. I have failed the ninth grade three times. I do not have a, a high school diploma. I got kicked out of high school in the ninth grade. I, I was drinking at, at school. I remember drinking Bacardi at the bus stop, and this normal girl walked up, and she was like, are you drinking whiskey at the bus stop? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and I just remember, like, how shocked and, and puzzled she was, right? And I um, ended up getting uh, kicked out for that, and then I ended up getting kicked out for selling acid. I was selling acid at school. This this teacher saw that I was ripping sheets or ripping hits off the sheet of acid. He's like, what are you doing? He tapped me. It was a boy's bathroom, and I just threw them in the urinal. And of course, they just circle in the <laughs> urinal. They don't go anywhere. <laughs> But I had more um, acid in my pocket and lots of money, and that was the first. You know, that was um, actually got us exposed to Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous at age 16. That was my first experience. We, my parents would drive me to this treatment center in downtown Atlanta, and I started going to meetings there. And I went to meetings high there, and uh, I just did that just to get just to get the, the cord off my back. You know, and, um, but I heard a message, you know, and I think the thing that I loved most about Alcoholics Anonymous was the honesty, like the transparency and like people, I never heard people be that honest about who they were. Cause people always like, kind of like, I feel like hide or aren't completely transparent about who they are. And, and I'd never seen people like y'all that were like sharing from your heart and not your head. And, uh, I was I was like, I, I kind of filed it in the way, in the back of my mind, filed it away. I was like, well, if I ever need help, maybe I can come back here. But who wants to get sober at 16? I know it happens, but for me, it wasn't going to happen. And um, after all the trouble with getting arrested, um, you know, kind of blew over. Um, I just fell into this pathetic relationship with alcohol and drugs, especially um, crack. I got really bad into crack cocaine. I got a job at Taco Bell. And uh, my, my mom would let me use her car. And uh, it was right about the time that I got my first ATM card. And uh, ATM and crack cocaine do not go well together. <laughs> and uh, I remember driving my mom's, we called it the Republican Mobile because it looked like some like politician was going to pull up and it. it was like had this big, big hood ornament and we would drive it down into the projects in Atlanta and buy crack from this kid on the street and... And just how insane that was. Like, I just, one day I'm a kid jumping ramps on my bicycle, and then the next day I'm driving with my knee, dry, going down Highway 285, smoking crack, and I can't stop. You know? I remember one time we were smoking, and the guy that I was with, I started to have chest pain, really severe chest pain. And then I was like, <laughs> and then I, like, passed out. Like, I remember, like, hitting... I hit the car and I slid down and I lost consciousness and I woke up to my friend slapping me in my face, you know, and if you're going to do that kind of behavior, hang out with somebody who knows like first aid or like CPR. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what we do in the emergency room. <laughs> Get it together, man. <laughs> but I, I remember like I pushed myself he helped me to get to a standing position again. And um, and I remember I caught my breath and I'm like, give me that pipe, let me try that again. You know? And I've done that so many times in so many different ways. Another time we were camping in the North Georgia Mountains. I love outside, like I see God outside big time. I, I, that's why I live in Alaska. I live right at the base of the Chugach Mountains. I backpack all the time. I hike, I can cross country ski from my house. I love it. It's, I really see my higher power there. In fact, when I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't see my higher power in you. I just saw it outside. And then I started to see it in you. 
And then over time, I started to see it in me. But anyway, I we were up in the North Georgia mountains, and I got drunk, and I was like, that's psilocybin. And my friends were like, I don't think that's psilocybin. Don't eat that. <laughs> and I ate it. And um, it was I was really drunk when I ate it, and um, we were kind of having fun. It was, about, it was all the cool kids. It was all the popular kids at the around the, the bonfire. And the next thing you know, I'm like, I don't think I can stand up anymore. And then I'm sideways on the ground. And then I started puking, pooping, and peeing my pants. And I was completely paralyzed. And um, they grabbed me and, and dragged me to a trailhead. We were like three miles up this trail. And there's four or five of them that had to carry me like that. One of them's got you know my arms. One of them's got my legs. And um, they called 911 and the paramedics. Um, I remember fighting with the paramedics as best as I could. But then I... They sedated me and they intubated me. And then um, that's the last thing I know. And then I wake up in the intensive care unit a couple days later. And um, I was on a ventilator. They were ready to put me on um, dialysis. And uh, I remember my doctor was like this handsome doctor. Young, smart, handsome. Don't know where he is, but I'd like to find him now. <laughs> But he was like, um, he's not young anymore. <laughs> but I remember he was like, that was really foolish. Why would you do something like that? And like you said last night, I had no answer. I just had no answer why I did that. And But I had the firm resolution not to do this again. I'm not going to do this again. And intellectually, I'm a pretty bright girl. But when it comes to alcohol and drugs, I'm a dumbass. Like, I, I just, there is no... There is no logic to my disease. It, there's no logic. I was drinking three days after I got discharged from the ICU, you know, and all the things that I tell myself, well, I'm going to drink beer only, you know, or having bad trips on acid. I'm like, oh, that was bad. This time I'm going to get drunk first, then take the acid, because I'm always in a good mood when I'm drunk. <laughs> Just all these stupid things that I tell myself. And so I had this illogical disease. And Alcoholics Anonymous is illogical. Like, it does not, the steps are illogical. Like, I don't understand why this works. I don't understand why prayer and meditation works. I don't understand why saying yes works. I don't understand why, like, being vulnerable works. But it does. And so I just continue to do it, even though it's illogical. Because I have an illogical problem. Like, I don't understand God intellectually, but logically... Illogically, I've seen it, you know, I've seen it in my own life. Like, it's it's 100% evident. Like, I don't want to get drunk and high today. That's a miracle. I work around drugs, that, like, really good stuff, like, that, you know, <laughs> and I don't want to steal it, you know, and that's a miracle. And, uh, anyway, what was I talking about? Um, was that the, the mushrooms, yeah. And so I, I got into this relationship with this other person who was just as bad as I was, it's very uncomfortable for me to hang out with normal people that don't drink and do drugs like I do. It's, I stand out. It's very obvious that I'm not drinking like you are, so I pick my people. And in the end, there were no people. I was just by myself. But uh, I got into this relationship with this man, and he had some money. He was a little bit older. Uh, he had a place in Athens. I, I moved in with him in Athens, Georgia, where UGA is. And um, we just... I just fell into this twisted relationship with alcohol where I was blacking out. I had never blacked out like this before, but I really started to black out when I was like 17, 18 years old. And I had my own car at that time. And I remember one night, uh, my boyfriend and I got in a fight. And uh, and I came to driving my car. I don't remember getting in the car. I came to driving down the main street in Athens, going about 45 miles an hour. The first thing I saw was the, speed, the speedometer. And I was like, where am I? You know, and then I looked down and I put my panties on over my jeans. Like, and I was so, I was like, what if I get pulled over? Then the cops going to see that I got my panties on over my jeans. <laughs> Never mind that I came to driving a car in a blackout. Like, it was all about, like, how, how am I going to look? You know, this is not going to look good. And then just driving so drunk that I'm like, if I just change the radio station, I'll drive better. If I just roll down the windows and have it cool enough, I'll drive better. You know, like putting, you know, trying to open the door and lift the white, but then the wind's blowing, you know, really hard. And it's like coming to blacked out so many times. And the other thing I would do is I would get really drunk 
and then I would take a hit acid, not remember taking a hit acid. And like, I was really drunk and then suddenly I was very not drunk and tripping. And I, I don't remember, you know, doing those types of things. I started to feel so dark inside, so pathetic and anything to make me feel better. And I, I had never been a huge fan of the South. I always wanted to be out West. I remember as a kid, I would read National Geographic about, you know, the Rockies and Alaska and, you know, Western Canada and stuff. And I'm like, you know what? I think if I get out of Atlanta, things will be better. And so when I was 19 years old, um, uh, me and a couple of buddies, we decided to bicycle across the country. And so in, in uh, September, excuse me, April of 1993, we, we bought little 21 speed bikes and put saddlebags on them. And we started across the country and I got in really good shape. I would, it was, I didn't drink that much when I was on that trip. It was, uh, I did smoke some weed, but I thought, yeah, this is the solution to the problem that I have some exercise some open air change of environment that that'll help. You know, I ended up in Montana and, um, the only thing different was I just didn't have crack and I couldn't find acid. And so I just sort of fell into this path pathetic relationship with alcohol. Um, I turned 21 in Montana. I remember I, I went there and I was like, I'm going to be an explorer. I'm going to explore. Like I was on the West boundary of Yellowstone park and like, I'm going to climb mountains. I'm going to do all this stuff. And I'm, I'm drinking all the time. You know, I remember one time I, I got high and went snowshoeing. I was like, I was listening to like this Native American flute music, and like hiking out there, <laughs> stoned. And then I came across my tracks. I'd walked a complete circle. <laughs> I'm a mountain woman, you know. <laughs> and, um, but like, it got really bad. I turned 21 at, at Strozzi's Bar in West Yellowstone, Montana. It's this biker bar, and I turned 21 there, and I. I made a fool of myself. I tried to fight my best friend and super nice guy. And I tried to fight him for no reason, whatever. And, you know, so Montana must be the problem. I think it's, you know, I got to get out of Montana. And I'd always wanted to go to Alaska. And so the summer of 1994, me and a couple of friends that were on that same bike trip, we decided to bicycle to Alaska. And on the same bike that I rode to Montana, and uh, I saved up some money um, at this little restaurant I was working at. And um, we entered Canada and we had a big bag of weed. So everything was great in the beginning, right? Like, I didn't realize how sick I was until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. Like, I, I didn't know what I was like when I was sober because I never came down for like seven years. And then when I don't have drugs or alcohol, it's really uncomfortable for me. Like, I use alcohol and drugs to medicate the way I feel about myself, to medicate the way that I feel about you, and to medicate the way I feel about every circumstance there is. So in the beginning, this trip was amazing, right? We're, like, biking through Jasper and Banff, and I'm like, this is so gorgeous, you know? And I'm like, I'm a free spirit. Like, I was, when you're bicycling like that, you find all kinds of roadkill animals. I had, like, feathers and rattles and, like, skulls hanging off my bike. I thought I was, like, some... <laughs> some mystic, you know, <laughs> I was super judgy of people in RVs. <laughs> we called them the auto morons. You know, it's funny how like when you're in the gutter looking at other people, judging them, I always think that's so funny about it. Hey, it's like, I get these people that come in and anyway, um, so riding up the Alaska highway, um, ran out of money. Um, started actually I'll back up a little bit I started um the pot ran out and then I started to drink uh, I remember being in Jasper I went into a bar and my friends were like I was hung over the next morning and they're like let's go let's go you know and I was I was always like making them late you know I couldn't get up and start riding until I was you know somewhat hydrated and and um what there's no way I could do that now like I'm when you're in your 20s, you can just, like, get beat up over and over again, but not anymore. And, um, but I was bicycling. I was eating um, instant mashed potatoes and ramen noodles all the time. And uh, I wasn't taking in enough calories. I've always been a pretty thin person, but I was super thin back then. And uh, I ran out of money at mile 497 of the Alaska Highway. I know that because I got a job at that. There's a little place there called the Yard Hot Springs. 
there's a lodge there, and I got a job chinking the lodge, you know, stuffing insulation between the lodge logs. And um, I had been collecting aluminum cans up to that point and selling them. You know, I was riding with these giant bags of aluminum cans on either side of my bike with rattles and feathers hanging on <laughs> And I hadn't showered in so long. Like, and synthetic clothing, when you haven't showered, like, it's nasty. Like, it's super nasty. I call it the homeless guy smell. It's so bad. And uh, ended up getting some more money there at the Art Hut Springs and then um, ended up riding into Alaska. I ran out of money again in Skagway, Alaska. I was working at a little... Um, restaurant washing dishes I would get um, off work at 2 in the afternoon and I'd be like I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to drink I was living in my tent in the campground outside of Skagway, beautiful area I don't know if you've been there but it's beautiful but I'm miserable and I lived there for about a month and a half just drinking every day saying I'm not going to drink and by 5 o'clock I've given up the fight and uh, you know in the book like when I would first read that stuff, it just seemed so stupid to me. Like, the language just seemed ridiculous. Like, if you're not alcoholic, that book is the dumbest shit ever. Like, it makes no <laughs> sense. But when you're like me, I'm like, oh, my God. You know, it's like it's like trying to tell a normal person about what it's like to be an alcoholic. And, um, you know, I relate to, oh, well, I've messed up. I might as well get good and drunk again. You know, what's the use anyhow? Like, I relate to all that stuff. And I got to that incomprehensible demoralization. I was in Skagway, and I was just, I was starting to have neuropathy. Like, I was starting to have numbness in my hands. I'm 21 years old, and I'm having numbness in my hands from my drinking. I was shaking. Uh, I learned that you could keep drinking. You know, I would go to work in the morning drunk, you know. And um, I just had this dumb stoner laugh. <sighs> Like, there was nothing, <laughs> there was nothing, like, I felt so empty, you know, and I knew that I was smarter than that, I knew I was, there was more of a spark for life, like, I always had this childlike sense of wonder since I was a little kid, and alcohol said, peace out, you know, and everything that many anything just was taken away from me one at a time by alcohol, and uh, we were out, uh, there was a bonfire on the beach one night out of Skagway, and, uh, I remember this guy was talking about beating up his brother and everybody was cheering him on. Oh, you beat up your brother. Good job. That's awesome. And it was like this macho, tough guy talk going at the, and this voice inside my head said, look who you're hanging out with. And I, it was, it was, it was really pr pretty powerful. And then I walked over to the ocean there. I don't know what that water is called there, but um, it's beautiful. There's like mountains that come straight, just straight up out of the water. And, my dead grandmother spoke to me, you know, the one who I'd written the promise to. She said, you owe me something. And it was in her voice, in my head. I'm getting chicken skin, actually, right now. I'm just thinking about that. Like, it was very powerful. It was a, it was a total burning bush experience. It wasn't my voice. It wasn't just, like, weird stuff in my head because I'm high and drunk. It was full on my Ruby McClintock's voice. And um, it was so powerful. And I was like, I had a strong resolution not to drink again. I've had a burning bush experience, you know. My dead grandmother spoke to me. And the long and the short of it is I, I ended up going back to the lower 48. I ended up, um, I went briefly back to my parents' house. I had three months of sobriety. I was not really going to meetings. I did go to a couple of meetings. I thought meetings were just kind of like inspirational places that you went from time to time, you know stop in, visit, and, and come back a little bit later. And um, I started getting really fit. I was like, if I lift weights, you know, if I get fit, and I got fit, and I got a boyfriend, you know, that's my solution to alcoholism, you know, fitness, boyfriend, and a job, you know, it's the three-step program, yes, you know, <laughs> cure alcoholism. And I started to plan a drunk. I started to plan it. Like, I knew I was going to do it. I said... You know, one other thing from the book is my long period of sobriety had qualified me to drink like normal people. And I'd been sober three months, and so I planned a drunk. And I was staying with my parents. Uh, I was getting ready to go back to Montana. And um, I decided I was going to go to the bar and drink four beers. Why four? Because four feels really good. You know, four is really sweet. It's kind of my sweet spot where I'm funny and I feel sexy. But I can't stop at four. I can't. I don't know how many I drank that night, 
but um, way over four, in and out of a blackout. And then I, the next thing I know, I'm smoking crack with a guy in a bathroom stall. Shortly thereafter, we're having sex in the bathroom stall. Like, while other people are coming and using the bathroom. And I just felt so disgusted. Like, this guy was not hot. It wasn't like he was... It wasn't like it was a good-looking dude. And I was like, oh, my God, what am I doing? And then I remember I drove home in a, in a blackout. And uh, that was my last drunk. That was November 27, 1994. I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous um, in Montana uh, shortly thereafter. And I walked in. And it was a bunch of old cowboys. I was, at that time, I hadn't transitioned. I was out as gay. And I had longish hair then. And I used to, I've always worn makeup. I had eyeliner on. I had span, I had the same spandex that I'd ridden from Alaska, you know, that I wore when I rode to Alaska. I'd washed it several times. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, like, I was welcomed in Alcohol- Alcoholics Anonymous as a gay man. Like, I really, uh... That was the time. That was the same time that Matthew Shepard was beaten in Wyoming, and I was so shocked at, in AA that these cowboys were just so welcoming. Actually, you were when you were talking last night. I was like, you remind me of one of the dudes that was in that meeting, like these old cowboys that were just serene and like my mind said, "You're different. You're different. You're different. You're different." But you're dying of alcoholism different dying of alcoholism and so I became teachable a little bit just a little bit there's two parts to step one you know it's easy to admit that I'm powerless over alcohol as evidenced by everything I've told you but the challenge for me is that my life is unmanageable you know that new that dash the hyphen or whatever it is new thought my my life had become unmanageable like I didn't buy that I really did not buy that I came to AA I saw these older guys that just seemed to be like serene and comfortable in their own skin they would share honestly about what their experience was like I, I struggled with God I really struggled with God especially as a, a queer and trans person in Alcoholics Anonymous and um, I remember sharing that at one of the meetings in this old cowboy named um, Harry he had a dump truck business called Dirty Harry's <laughs> dump truck business <laughs> but he was short and he would like his hands were like as big as his podium like he looked like Popeye and um, he had like, he was missing his front teeth, but there was like, yeah, fake ones. And then he'd mess with you and he'd push the fake ones out and make them go in and out. <laughs> but he, he said something one night at a meeting that was so profound. I was really struggling with God. I really, um, the whole Christian God, you know, I was really struggling with that. And, and Harry said, uh, what did he say? I always forget this. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous will work for you if you believe you believe in Jesus Christ. Alcoholics Anonymous will work for you if you don't believe in Jesus Christ. And even if you believe that you are Jesus Christ, Alcoholics Anonymous will work for you. <laughs> and it, was, it made me feel so welcome and safe. <laughs> and um, that same guy like talked about, um, he was in Yellowstone trying to get from West Yellowstone to Cody and he ended up beating up a tourist. There was a bear off the road, and uh, that cowboy guy ended up losing his temper. And I remember him coming to a meeting and sharing about that. And, like, he was doing a 10-step with us, you know? And, and uh, I didn't know that at the time, but it, that was so attractive to me was that you were willing to just share what you were all about and your struggles. And there wasn't a lot of emphasis on the, on the big book there. There was a little bit, um, but there wasn't a lot of emphasis on sponsorship either. And I got to a place where I thought my recovery is about advancing my life. You know, that's what, it, that's what recovery is all about. It's like getting mine because alcohol has robbed me of the things that I always wanted to do. Now it's time for makeup. You know, I've got to get the sweet job. I got to get the boyfriend. I've got to get that life that I think is uh, the signs of a successful life. And, uh, I was five years sober and I, I had not worked any steps um, when I was three years sober, I had gotten a job up in Denali National Park working for the Park Service. And I was a backcountry ranger. And like all of my self-worth came from that job. I got paid to backpack. I got paid to teach people about bear behavior and, and like help biologists and stuff. And, you know, the part in the book where it talks about the actor trying to run, trying to be the director, right? Like the director runs the film, but the actor that takes over from the director. And I really felt that like, 
I got to experience what it's like to be unmanageable sober. And I really hope if you're new, you get the chance to experience that because that's where the crux is for me. Is like, you know, there's, there's, there's three or four requirements for step three, right? The first one is that I be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. And the only way I got to that point was by doing that, you know, by being that, being that actor trying to, you know, completely power, powerless, you know, it talks about finite and infinite. I'm a finite actor trying to run this huge show, thinking that I'll be happy if I can only, you know, manage well. So that's the first requirement. Step one is that I'm convinced that the way that I manage the show sucks. You know, selfishness, self-centeredness, that's my, the root of my troubles. Like, I saw that. I got to see that sober. Like, not even taking a drink. The drinking is the tip of the iceberg. You know? We step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate, right? So our troubles are basically of our own making. Like, I never saw that. I was such a victim. Like, of always pointing fingers, super judgy of you and going really easy on myself. And if it were a scale, like in the fourth step, if it were a scale... I know we, some people say my part, my fault, whatever, but my part was like this and yours was up here. Like I had been such a hypocrite, you know, I wanted you to be kind and loving, but I wasn't kind and loving. You know, I expected you to be accepting, but I wasn't accepting. And, uh, I was super broken. I was ready to drink again. You know, four and a half years, I'm ready to drink again. The story in the book about the dude who puts whiskey in his milk that is perfect for me. That dude's got the spiritual malady when he comes into work. He's irritated with the boss. He, um, his ego's hurt because he used to own the business. And now he's just a salesman. He goes out into the countryside. He goes into a bar, glass of milk. You know how the story goes, right? And then he gets to thinking that um, I can put whiskey in my milk. I'll be safe. And then the physical allergy starts. My sponsor pointed out when we first started working together that the spiritual malady will lead to the mental obsession. If it's not checked, it will lead to the mental obsession, which will eventually lead to the spiritual malady. And so I can't do anything about the mental obsession or the physical allergy, but I can arrest the spiritual malady. And that's what these steps are about, right? Like, is, is to find a power which will solve my problem. And uh, I became super teachable. I was... I was really holding this unique badge. Like I said earlier, there was some guys that were driving down from Bozeman. This would have been about 90, 95 or 96. And they were like, you need a sponsor. <laughs> you're like dry. Like you are super dry. You're going to catch on fire when you're so dry. <laughs> Thank you. And, um, but I was, I was, you know, door number one or door number two, go on to the bitter end or accept spiritual help. And then, so I started working with this, cis straight guy who I was super um, judgy about and um, he took me through that book and I became a it, it just became a living like he shared his experience and it came alive to me before I, I didn't read it with anybody it was just like weird it didn't make any sense you know I'd see all those the Jay Walker and John Barleycorn and like Mr. Brown and all that crap was just didn't make any sense <laughs> but then when I read it with another alcoholic it came alive and he related it to me, and he asked me questions, and and I finally admitted to my innermost self that I was a real alcoholic, and that I needed a spiritual solution. Um, I can't control the amount I take, and even when I want to stay sober, I can't. I've got both of those that it talks about at the beginning of We Agnostics. So I'm not, and it's a it's it's an or question. It's not an and. I've got I've got both of those, however, and. Um, I, immediately upon asking this man to sponsor me, I felt really uncomfortable. I knew he was going to hold me accountable. And that's one of the things I hate is to be held accountable. That's really uncomfortable for me. And um, we started working the steps, and I started surrendering my thinking. He taught me that set-aside prayer that was mentioned earlier this, this weekend. And uh, I really started to have a, a massive change in my life. I was really struggling financially at that time. I started to earn some money and save up some money. Um, that was my money, you know, that was my money. I was building my life back up. And my sponsor was like, I think you need to go back to Atlanta and make some amends. And I would worked at that Taco Bell for years, stealing money from the register at Taco Bell. That was my, my amends that I thought I was going to go to jail for. You know, I'd stolen a lot of money over the course of the time I worked there. And um, I went into that Taco Bell at the suggestion of my sponsor. You know, I remember talking to my sponsor. I'm like, this is it. All right, I'm going to jail. I'm not going to be of use to anybody when I'm in jail. <laughs> and he's like, no, you can take meetings into jail. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
But I walked in there and it was a, a franchise Taco Bell. Like it used to be a corporate Taco Bell and now it's franchise. And so the manager was like, it's cool. We're all good. You know, I mean, we're not, we're not corporate Taco Bell. We were back then, but don't worry about it. And I told my sponsor, he's like, why don't you call up corporate Taco Bell? <laughs> and I ended up um, making amends over the phone to this, this woman. And she kind of read me the riot act about it. And again, like somebody else said, that they didn't have a way to take stolen money back into the till. And so she said, put that money in an offering plate. And I wasn't going to church. And so I gave that money to my mom and dad. And they put that in the offering plate at their church. You know, and that, I remember that was where like, I really started to trust God was that specific amen. Because I thought that I was going to be dumped on my butt, right? Like God's going to bail on me. And if I really look back at all the things that I've been super afraid of, like they've all really turned out to be you know, not that big of a deal. Like when I started to transition, I, I, I was 20, 24 years sober when I started to transition. It just, I feel like talking about being trans with a bunch of cis people is like going as an alcoholic and talking to a bunch of non-alcoholics. I feel like when I talk about it, I'm being looked at like half three heads, but it's a thing for me and I can't explain why I have it, but it is, it's there. And this, it came up so strong like a pimple that needs to be popped. And it was like getting stronger and stronger and stronger to where I couldn't deny it anymore. And I was so attached to your approval. I got so much approval as a man and like being this mask. I got super fit one time. Like I had abs, like six pack and I was all muscular. And it was like, I was doing that for you, right? Like I wasn't being myself. And that was one of my greatest fears is that, you know, I'm going to lose those that I love if I transition. I'm going to lose my family. I'm going to lose my friends. Uh, I'm going to be ugly. I'm going to be wrong with God. I'm cutting myself off from the sunlight of the spirit if I transition. This is unnatural. Like all of these fixed ideas for this thing that's been with me since I was like the very first thought that I really remember. I have two memories that are super old. One is riding a big wheel really fast, an orange big wheel, and seeing my feet like this, right? And then the other one is like praying to God that I would be a a girl. And we're in the world to play the role that God assigns, right? Like, and I, I finally heard that. I remember a guy sharing that from the podium. And I'm like, I remember like trying to pray the transness away. Like, I've been in multiple relationships with women. Like, I see like, I see like cis straight people like, kids, kids, we got kids, this is our, you know, it's like picket fence, you know, and like, I see this, like, it's like you always want what's on the other side, but you know, it's, that's not my truth, you know, and, and, um, but I had so much fear around that, and I have lost people in my life when I've transitioned, but like, a lot of those fears have not come, come true, you know, I thought that I was going to lose a relationship with my parents, and, um, they love me so much. Like my parents are uber conservative and, uh, they love their trans daughter. And it's, uh, they really, they really modeled to me God. Like they were, had my parents not modeled to me God, um, in my drinking and using, and then also in my recovery, I probably wouldn't be here. Like they were examples of higher power. And, um, I made amends to them. I, uh, I made amends to my mom and dad. They got the brunt of my alcoholism I was physically violent with my mom. She flushed crack cocaine down the toilet one time and I grabbed her by her blouse and slammed her against the wall and I said, I'll kill you if you don't stay out of my life. They locked their door because I was psychotic. Uh, I stole from them. I stole so much money from them. I stole their vehicles. I vandalized their house. I sold drugs out of their house. You know, my parents were professional people and I sold drugs out of their house and I treated them horribly. And I made formal amends to them in 1999. And um, it was such a powerful experience, you know, but that was just the beginning, right? Like, to make the formal amends is just the beginning. It talks about a demonstration afterwards, though, you know? And my sponsor was like, really, you need to pay attention when they say what they what you can do to make it right. And my dad said, show up and be our kid. And, and I'm 20, 24 years later, I'm still showing up and being their kid. You know, my dad also has dementia and is in a a nursing home. He's in stage. He intermittently knows who I am. Um, When I told him that I was trans and that I changed my name, he's like, you're my beautiful daughter, you know? And that was, uh, yeah, something I never thought I would see. I made that, so that 
my dad has cried three times that I know of. He's like this. Yeah, he just he doesn't cry. And uh, he cried when I got arrested for selling acid. Um, he cried when I graduated from nursing school when I was 11 years sober. And then he cried when he, he got diagnosed with dementia. It was the only time I ever seen my dad cry. He got diagnosed with dementia in 2017. And watching him decline is like one of the toughest things. It's almost, I think it's almost better if somebody just dies, you know, just to see my bright, funny dad, you know, be taken away a little bit at a time. Like, he's just whacked out. Like, he's completely out of touch with reality, which is so weird for me. But I, I've come to recognize that I carry him with me. Like, my sense of humor, my goofiness, my um, childlike sense of wonder, that comes from my parents. Like, they gave that to me. You know, the capacity for a spiritual life, my parents gave that to me. And um, I still carry him with me, you know. I'm actually going back there uh, next month. I've been back there so many times. I fly from Anchorage. I'm like a MVP gold with Alaska Airlines because I'm always flying to Atlanta. And uh, a few years back, it's been probably 2016, my dad told me, um, nobody makes your mother laugh like you do. And uh, I call my mother frequently on FaceTime, and we laugh a lot. Like, I, that's my job is to make ease my mom's way right now. Watching her husband of 61 years tell, he, he'll, she'll go see him, and she'll be like, he'll be like, I'm, I'm seeing another woman. I want a divorce. He was just completely whacked. And um, he's been, like, the most faithful man in the world, and now he's suddenly this, like, He's like, when I killed a man the other night. <laughs> uh, just weird. <laughs> but, uh, but we, like, my mom, like, I've been easing her way. Like, I've been going and being of service to my family. Um, it's funny, like, when you talk to old people on the phone, they're, like, FaceTiming, and all you see is their eyebrows. <laughs> And so I'll start doing that to her. <laughs> or I'll, like, show my ear or something. <laughs> but we have a good time. And, um, yeah, she's been... Um, yeah, sobriety is, is such a gift. It's been... It's up and down. Like, I have had some incredible, powerful spiritual experiences. I've had incredible meditation, incredible connection with sponsees amends that were very powerful, like conferences like this where I'm just blown away, right? But my alcoholism doesn't care about that. It doesn't care who my sponsor is. It doesn't care how well I know the big book. It doesn't care about any of that crap. It's just like, I can get really sick really fast, really fast. And so I do a lot of AA. I sponsor a lot of people. It's really interesting. Thank you. It's really interesting since I transitioned, I am... Um, I had a bunch of male sponsees, and, and um, they all, one by one, and I understand they all left, and, and uh, but now my, I'm full again with, like, a bunch of queer and trans people and a, a couple of straight women, you know, and it's, uh, when I started the transition, one of my greatest things that I never even realized would be, like, a, a scary thing was, like, this, this woman asked me to sponsor her, and she didn't realize I was trans, and she didn't really care, but I remember, like, I think I should let her know. I don't think she knows. I'm just going to let her know. And um, I texted her and I said, just so you know, I'm trans. I, I've got a big year, but I'm still can, I'm super stoked to work with you. And uh, I didn't hear from her for like 36 hours. And I thought, you know, I was devastated in that time. Like the, the ability not to help other people recover from this was devastating to me. And she's like, no, I just didn't, you know, I'm not very good with my phone, you know, and I, I made it about me being trans. I do that on Zoom. I get asked to speak at meetings on Zoom, and when people start to leave the Zoom room, I think it's like, oh, they don't, it's because I'm trans. Some of that may be real, but a lot of it's fancy. You know, it talks about fancy, they're real. I know that my higher power wants me in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. I remember like, there's a room full of people who are in recovery right now, and I used to be like, what, what is your purpose for me, God? And like, all of these recovering alcoholics are staring back at me. Like, and I'm like, what, what, what do you want from me? And it's like, I'm like looking for something different. <laughs> I'm on a different purpose. <laughs> Helping other alcoholics, you know, I want something really cool. Like, like being the first one to discover aliens. I want to be that girl. <laughs> um, 
not help other alcoholics. That's just really lame. I want something super cool. I haven't done much on the whole, you know, finding aliens other than following people on Instagram. That's it. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, I've really struggled with some, some challenges here uh, in the last three years. Uh, in, in the last, I would say, ten years, I've, I've struggled with suicidal ideation. I don't know that I would drink. But my, more like I'd kill myself, you know, and that's the um, long term sobriety is like you think, oh, it's easy, and you're like some spiritual like guru. You're not. It's like I feel like the road becomes more narrow, and like there's less capacity to BS, you know. And um, it seems like I have to do more now than I used to have to do. And um, I was really, you know, just lamenting, like, I hated being trans. I felt like that was such a liability. Like, I want people to like me and accept me, but I can't think of anything more, like, to have people dislike you just suddenly off the bat, you know? I'm a trans woman, and, like, you're not super popular. It's not like a cool card. You don't realize how cool card you have. Like, when you walk in and you're in a cisgender heterosexual relationship, you don't have to worry about somebody beating the crap out of you or judging you, saying you're going to hell. And, uh... I wanted to be liked and, you know, I didn't want to have something like this and I've gotten suicidal in, in sobriety here uh, just in the last three years, actually. Uh, I had a really, I've had two really intense suicidal experiences with God where God, like, blew their anonymity and um, the first one was in 2012. I do a lot of backpacking. I do a lot of flying trips. Like, I get flown out to the bush. I like to be dropped off. Thank you. I'm going to go a little longer, sorry. Mm -hmm. I feel like that. don't be that girl, but here we go. And um, <laughs> I, uh, I got, as we were flying out there, I hated myself. I had this real pretty girl who was like, I was in a relationship with this pretty girl, and she's like, this is too weird. I feel like I'm sleeping with a woman, and I like men. This is just weird, and I'm going to break up with you. And I went out to do this flying backpacking trip. I like to collect skulls and antlers and and, you know, feathers and stuff like that. And so I go out to the bush to do that and uh, every, something to do every year. And and this pilot was flying me into this lake. And I remember we were circling. He was going to see if he could land at the lake. It was a little too short for the plane and the wind wasn't right. And I remember praying, God, just please crash the airplane. You know, please crash the airplane. It never occurred to me that there's a pilot in here with me. <laughs> he probably wasn't too keen on that. Anyway, we didn't crash the airplane. and um, But uh, I ended up camping by myself and backpacking by myself. And um, the whole time I had just, I hated who I was. I couldn't stand who I was. And um, it was a sunny day. It was May 27, 2012. And it was noon. It was right at 12 in the afternoon. And... Um, I was standing on a beaver dam. I'd been hiking, and I was taking a break, just kind of standing there. And I looked up, and I saw movement out of the corner of my eye, and there was a, a grizzly. It was probably, I don't know, it wasn't the biggest grizzly I've ever seen, but it was coming towards me, like walking, like kind of sniffing like this, that the moose calves have just been born, and so they hunt moose calves. And um, I did what you're supposed to do. You let them know what you are, right? Like, I'm not a moose calf. I said, hey, bear, and I yelled at it. And as soon as I said, hey, bear, and yelled at it, it started running at me as fast as it could run. And it came from, I don't know, maybe 300 feet away. And the whole time it was running at me, like, they're very powerful animals. And you think they're clumsy, but they're not. They're really fast and it was agile. And it was, like, coming over this uneven terrain. And as it was getting close, I could see the muscles rip rippling in its chest, and its head got bigger and bigger as it got closer. And I remember I'd had that suicidal ideation, and I was like... I don't want to die, God. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Like, I just kept saying it over and over again. And it was like God saying, this is what you want. This is what this looks like, you know? And it was like, it was, and I actually heard it at the conference a few years after this conference. Somebody said, um, suicide is the last attempt to play God. And uh, it was really, like, I had a huge, profound spiritual experience. The, the bear veered away, 20 feet away, and then went the other way. Didn't maul me. But it was like, it woke me up and it scared the hell out of me. And it just like, it was, it was a Scrooge type experience for me. And I just woke up and I, I had a new surrender, you know, kind of with my sexuality, my gender identity and just getting okay with being, one of my biggest fears was I'm going to be an old person alone. Being, I'm afraid of being an old person alone will make me do some jacked up stuff. I'll get into relationships with somebody I got no business being in with. 
because I need you on the outside to validate me. And uh, I got I got surrendered with that. Um, fast forward to to 2019. I'm um, I, I, I was like I I've got to transition. This is su- super uncomfortable. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I can't. It was like there's some parallels between alcoholism. I can't imagine life as a boy. And I'm super scared to go forward and transition to be a girl because it's going to be so weird and you're going to hate me and God's going to hate me and I'm burning hell. And I'm like, but the, this, this thing is in me and it's like trying to like be like, oh, I don't want my right arm. Like, I'm just going to like ignore my right arm. Like, it's not there. You know, it's just as much a part of me as everything is. A, I, like, I can't. I really appreciated what you said about like wanting to apologize for who I am, like just at the get go. And, I, I started to transition. I started to tell people to call me Maddie. And I, um, I started to say, please use female pronouns. And I felt like such a freak in the beginning, such a freak. And I, I, like I said, I do a lot of hiking. And I was hiking behind my house in the mountains up behind my house. And uh, I carry a gun now after the experience with the bear. And so I have a, a gun on my chest. And I found a, where a moose was killed by a bear and the bear was feeding on the moose and I wanted the skull and I kept going and checking to see if the bears had moved off the carcass so I could get the skull. And I did this for like a week. I kept going up there checking and going up and, and, and one of those days I was coming down and I was like, I can't transition. I'm, I'm, I got to kill myself. Like there was a group of trees that I was going to go to. Like I was like, I got to, I got to go do this. And like, I don't know if you've been in that level where you, you know, you're like contemplating it and you're really close to doing it and you just feel pathetic about it. Like there's so much self pity. You know, I used to think that self pity was like an honorable thing, like feeling sorry for yourself. I used to think that was an honorable thing, but it's just another form of self. And so I picked this group of trees that I was going to go to and shoot myself in the head And, you know, I was imagining the best way to do it. I've seen people try to kill themselves and not be successful. And I know how to, where to shoot myself to be successful. And I was going down the trail. I was coming down and it was a rainy Tuesday. It was cold. It was October. Um, We don't, there's not a lot of people on our trails. You know, we don't have everybody and their mother on their trip on the trails. It's few people. And I, a lot of times I'll know who, who, who the people are. And I was going down the trail and this other trans woman came up the trail and she was like ripped like you are. She was all like tatted up. She had a U.S. Marine Corps thing on her arm. You know, that the feather thing or the snake thing anyway. But she had her eyes all done and she was like smiling. Like it was eerie. Like I don't know where the hell that woman came from, but it was a total God shot. It was a total God shot. It was like, it was just a little glimpse into, no, you can be happy. You can be happy. And it, I didn't see it quite as that powerful of an experience immediately. I was kind of like, it did, it did pull me away from actually doing it that day. But I'm so glad that God has intervened, like full-on intervention in my life so many times. I, really, I got a big resentment against my home group, and I'll wrap up with this. Like, um, I, I'll just say, I'm not going to talk to you about the resentment, but I almost left my home group real recently. But I know God wants me to be in that home group. There was a trans man who came into that home group about, I don't know, two months ago. And a bunch of dudes, like, if you come into my home group, they're, you're going to get attacked. Like, if, you're, if they don't, they need to know you've got a sponsor and a book before you walk out of there. It's aggressive. It's really aggressive. <laughs> and they just attack this dude. And he was like, get the F back, you know. He was like, this is too much. This, I don't relate to this. Y'all are like, like, I mean, there's a lot of like tough guy kind of misogynistic, womanizing type guys in my group. And they're like bum rushing this guy. And uh, he was ready to walk the hell out. And um, somebody said, go talk to Madison. And um, that guy asked me to sponsor him. And we're going through the book. And as a, as a trans person, I know how to help him relate to the content that's in that book, you know. So I'm just going to stick around Alcoholics Anonymous because it's not about me. It's about what can I bring to the table, whether or not you approve of me or, or not. And so thank you so much for letting me be here.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.